Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Three months ago, Boeing's Starliner rolled out of its integration facility, getting ready to carry two astronauts to the International Space Station. Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams, better known as Butch and Sonny. And now even better known, beyond your average spaceflight nerd, as the story of this flight has been carried by major news channels on the account of the fact that uh, Butch and Sonny have spent the last two months on the International Space Station and aren't going home until next year. And if everything is going to plan, they'll be going home on a SpaceX spacecraft rather than a Boeing spacecraft. That is the decision which was announced yesterday after weeks of testing, analysis and uh, meetings on this subject. It's decided that instead of risking the crew on the Starliner spacecraft, which has a few issues, NASA is only going to send up two astronauts on Crew-9. And after a six-month rotation, Butch and Sonny will return home on that spacecraft. Initially, only two test flights had been planned, but on the very first Starliner flight, there were software issues which led to the spacecraft almost not making it to orbit and being unable to reach the International Space Station. So plans were changed. A second test flight with no crew was planned. And this one, after many delays, was ready to launch at the end of July 2021. That was when they found problems with valve positions in the spacecraft. And uh, they had to abort the launch, take it all the way back, literally tear down the propulsion system and rebuild it because there were issues with uh, corrosion due to the propellant interacting with moisture in the air, apparently. This led to basically like almost a year delay. It wasn't until May of 2022 that they finally launched and made it to the space station. And of course, carrying a little uh, plushy Kerbal with them too. And so that proved that the spacecraft was finally safe and so with that, they proved the spacecraft was safe for flight. They could move forward with the crew test, right? But no, no, they had to go and fix issues with wiring harnesses that were potentially combustible. They had uh, issues with the parachute uh, harnesses and they had to fix those. But eventually, in May, they were ready to go. In May, the Atlas V Starliner rolls out to the pad. Uh, Butch and Sonny are sitting on board, counting down to launch. And then... Bizarrely, the launch ends up being delayed because the booster has a problem. The Atlas V and Centaur has been an incredibly reliable booster, but in this case, there is a chattering oxygen relief valve. That means it's opening and closing very quickly and making a, you know, a sound. And so they have to roll the entire booster back to fix this. And replacing a valve on a Centaur uh, is complicated by the fact that the Centaur is stabilized by its own pressure. So if you're going to take a pressure valve off, it'll lose that pressure. It needs a whole supporting structure to hold up the tank while they're performing the valve replacement. That's why it took them a month before they finally launched in early June. And on this flight, the one that we are currently in the middle of, they have problems with their thrusters. There's two things. First of all, there's uh, leaks in the helium system. And look, helium is a tricky bugger. It will try to escape via any opportunity you give. So, like, okay, you know, people solve these problems over time. The, the bigger problem is that the thrusters they are using to control the spacecraft are starting to perform out of spec and the system's warning them that they're having to take the thrusters offline because if the thruster is not performing you know, to its specification, there's a chance that something is going wrong, it's damaging itself, it's potentially gonna fail in some more catastrophic way. But they're able to work through this and approach the space station safely and perform a docking to the ISS. And so now they're safely at the space station. They can uh, stretch their legs, get on board, have some fun, talk to their new friends, because they're going to be hanging out with these people for a little longer than they expected. I mean, the initial mission was supposed to be a couple of weeks, but in the interests of safety, um, engineers on the ground want to investigate these thruster issues and see if there's something that they can understand. They, you know, they look at the helium issues and it turns out that while a lot of the talk early on is about helium leaks, that's not the showstopper. It's these thrusters. And it's not that the thrusters are necessarily performing that far out of spec, but... As an engineer, you want to understand what is going on, because if you don't understand these small out-of-spec uh, readings, 
could actually be harbingers of something much more catastrophic about to happen. And we see this all the time in aviation, where minor issues get ignored and misunderstood and they turn into major disasters. So Butch and Sonny find out early on that they're going to be spending a little extra time on the International Space Station. Meyneanwhile, the Boeing and Aerojet Rocketdyne engineers get to work trying to replicate the problems that they have seen uh, with the engines. And so they're doing engine firings at White Stands, uh, Sands test range. And I'm sure over the last two and a half months, these engineers have been putting in a lot of overtime trying to understand this problem because these engines are all in the service module and the service module is going to get ditched. It's going to burn up so they won't be able to bring them back for testing. The engines sit in these uh, structures on the side of the spacecraft. They're, they're in a cluster here. These are called dog houses. And one of the theories is that the dog houses are allowing too much heat to be retained. And so when they're doing these, a lot of thruster firings over time, the heat is reaching higher temperatures than it has during the tests. And the tests at White Sands have shown that the, some of the Teflon seals used to drive the valves are expanding and distorting and restricting the, the oxidizer valves which in turn means that the thrusters aren't turning on with as high a performance as expected. And that sounds totally plausible as an explanation, but you know, there's a few questions still. For example, they subsequently did tests of the engines on in orbit and some of the engines returned to normal performance. So they need to figure out how the Teflon seals are, you know, not getting in the way after they were getting in the way, they need to f quantify this risk. And frankly, they haven't been able to quantify the risk to the level that is required to trust it for to put crew on board. And there's two concerns here. One is that the spacecraft could just fail to reach re-entry, which I think is highly unlikely because they still have reserve entry of thrusters on the capsule itself. But equally, during departure from the ISS, they could get into a situation where the the trajectory is going to carry it back into the ISS and cause some damage. And there just really isn't the knowledge to understand this problem. That's why Butch and Sonny are going to be switching their return ride from a Starliner to the Crew-9 Dragon. And that was originally supposed to have launched by now, but it has been delayed because Starliner has been occupying its parking spot at the space station. Now, a Crew Dragon has four seats, and the original plan for Crew-9 was going to be Xena Cardman, Nick Haig, and Stephanie Wilson, along with Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbunov. But, of course, if they're going to have two extra passengers on the way down, they need to get rid of two people, and it's not clear who is actually going to fly on Crew-9. Now, you might think that Xena Cardman and Nick Haig would be the two because they were in the center seats and they were training for that role. She was the mission commander. But Xena is a rookie. She's never been to the ISS. And NASA wants any spacecraft going to the ISS to have crew on board that has that experience. The uh, Roscosmos cosmonaut, uh, Alexander Gorbunov, he has no ISS experience either. So uh, if... Roscosmos requires him to be on board. That means that Xena can't go. And so that would suggest then that Nick Haig has to become the commander. So I would bet if Roscosmos does their thing that it'll be Nick and Alexander, but that's all up in the air right now. They could pick somebody completely different. Now, because the uh, Dave Clark suits used in the Boeing are not compatible with SpaceX's suits, they'll have to bring up a pair of suits for the crew there. There is a SpaceX suit on orbit, but that is the, the contingency suit for Tracy Caldwell Dyson, who flew up on a Soyuz, and they want to make sure that she has an alternate way home as well. But before Crew-9 can get to the space station, Starliner is going to have to undock and free up its parking spot. That'll mean software updates, which, you know, we've heard about. I'm sure the undock and the return to Earth will probably not be a big deal. But, you know, in the interests of safety, this is what they've decided. And look, I think we should pause for a second and realize what a unique situation this is. This is the first time the U.S. has had two different active crew spacecraft, we have the luxury of being able to choose between one or the other. If this had happened five years ago, when the other return option was Soyuz, I'm not sure NASA would be quite as eager to switch the crew off of a Starliner, which has some minor issues, over to Soyuz, because Soyuz has its issues too. 
Indeed, in the last couple of years, we had Soyuz MS-23 losing its cooling circuit and the crew had to remain on station for a whole year as a, a replacement spacecraft or a replacement Soyuz was sent up. And don't be under the impression that Starliner is some ridiculously dangerous death trap, because as of right now, it is still the preferred return option in a contingency scenario. If there was a disaster on the space station right now, Butch and Sonny would fly back to Earth on the Starliner, because that is their best option. But yes, uh, when Starliner undocks to make room for Dra uh, Crew-9, that means there's going to be a few days where they don't have a dedicated return spacecraft. And the current contingency plans there is they basically strap themselves to the cargo underneath the seats in uh, an emergency scenario. Now, this highly unlikely this is going to happen, but that's it. Yeah, they're just going to lay down there and uh, their suits aren't going to be useful. So we'd better hope that the, the Dragon doesn't have any issues. But presumably soon after that, Crew-9 will get there with SpaceX suits for them and everything will be fine. You know, Butch and Sonny will spend another six months on the space station and their eight-day flight to space will turn into eight months in space. And I'm pretty sure at this point the, this will be career capping uh, you know, trip for these guys. Now, I did wonder if they would send anything back in Starliner, uh, some cargo. Like, I think the spacecraft might actually need a bit of mass, some ballast, but I'm sure that they'll look around the station and look for some low-profile things that can be sent back as cargo. Maybe they'll find something small, you know, something that could fit inside Starliner, something which may be even inextricably linked to Starliner, like a Boeing's reputation. But before Starliner is going to leave, there's going to be a Soyuz crew changeover. So we're going to have an extra crew come up in a Soyuz. And for, as a space nerd, I noticed right away that's going to be 12 people on the International Space Station, which is more than they've had for a very long time. The last time they had that many people would be in the shuttle era. Towards the end, they had two Soyuz launched and they would launch, uh, docked and they would have a shuttle come up. And uh, the most they actually had in that scenario was 13 people, seven people from the shuttle and six from the two Soyuz. The last time we had 13 people in the space station, one of the Soyuz crew was Tracy Caldwell Dyson, who is currently on the ISS as a member of a Soyuz crew. So while 12 isn't a record for the International Space Station, it's a big number. Also, in the next week, we have uh, Polaris Dawn and uh, a Blue Origin suborbital flight with six people on board. There's a chance if these things line up that we will have 22 humans in space at the same time for a you know, very short amount of time. But people have also been asking, um, you know, is this the first time that we've had crew go up in one spacecraft and come down on another? And no, it's not. We've actually had this quite a lot. People going up on the shuttle and then coming back on Soyuz, things like that. In the early days of the International Space Station, the plan was that the crews would be flown up uh, on the space shuttle and they would perform their crew rotation and the Soyuz would be kept as a sort of emergency spacecraft, right? So you would have a Soyuz crew come up and then they would switch over to the Soyuz that was there and bring it back. And so that's how they would refresh the station like uh, escape system. And these short flights to change the Soyuz over, this is how Roscosmos got started with the whole space tourism thing. They would send people up on one and they would come back. This would be just basically a, a refresh of the spacecraft. And back in 2002, Lance Bass, a singer with NSYNC, he was training to go on one of these tourist flights and ultimately that didn't work. They didn't get the funding, it fell through, so he didn't fly. Instead, an experienced crew did the changeover and we got like an ESA astronaut getting a small time. And then early 2023, the Columbia disaster happened. And that meant the Expedition 6 crew who had flown to the ISS on the space shuttle now had to return to Earth on the Soyuz instead. And that crew was Nikolai Bodarin, Ken Bowersox, who you might have seen the last few weeks because he is on all those press conferences with NASA about talking about Starliner. I'm not sure what his official title is, but he's, you know, in charge of a lot of this stuff. So he knows about, uh, you know, the potential problems with switching crew between return vehicles. And the third crew member is Don Pettit. And you might know him, he's made some great little videos showing effects in zero gravity. He's done fantastic photography and he's going back to space next month on a Soyuz. What are the odds of that, huh? But it gets better 
Because you see, that Soyuz that they had to use as a return vehicle, that was the first of the Soyuz TMA series. That's basically they'd extended the size of the couches a little, they'd made a few other modifications. So it was technically a test flight of a new version of a space capsule. And on return, they actually had some issues with the spacecraft and it performed a ballistic re-entry. So yes, they had problems with their re-entry as well. And that is a story I will tell in a different video. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.